Hi there, and thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Brave Files. Today, I talk to a young woman who is taking the state of Illinois by storm. Kena Collins is running for U.S. Congress against an incumbent that's had the seat for 23 years. While Kena has never held public office, she has been actively involved in bill creation at the state level, and she's committed to helping everyone have valid access to their elected leaders. For Kena, it's not about identity politics. She says you shouldn't vote for someone simply because they're black or a woman. Rather, she encourages you to vote for your own representation. This episode is all about understanding that we, as a nation, can create the change we wish to see in the world as long as we do it together as a community. But before we start the episode, I want to share something with you that I personally think is outrageously exciting. My second book on gratitude, it's called Grow Grateful, a gratitude journal for kids and families, comes out on December 3rd. Yay! I am so very, very excited. I've had such a great time connecting with parents all over the world about developing powerful, life-changing gratitude habits with their kids. And this book is designed to invite space for intentional connection, conversation, and reflection that will help the entire family increase their overall happiness and well-being. If you want to know more about the book and know when you can grab a copy, please sign up at brave.vickeryandco.com forward slash grow grateful. That address again is brave.vickeryandco.com forward slash grow grateful. Tenacious leader, problem solver. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Brave Files. This is your host, Heather Vickery, and I am so very happy that you've decided to join us today. You know, friends, while the list of really bad, no good, horrible things that have come with the election of Donald Trump there are a few standout moments that I'm truly grateful for. And one of them is the number of new people running for office, folks that might not have considered it before, well, let's face it, the world's biggest idiot got elected. In many cases, though, these people are far more intelligent and far more qualified than he who shall not be named again in this episode. I never say his name, just this one time. Um, no, but folks, seriously, today I am talking with Kina Collins. And Kina is not actually new to being politically active, at least locally. She's a nationally recognized gun violence prevention and healthcare advocate who is running for the Illinois 7 congressional district seat in the Democratic primary, which is going to be held here on March 17th, 2020. That is like a hot minute from now. Kina's lived experiences have prompted her to make a lifelong commitment to change and growth in her community and throughout the state and the country at large. Kina has also helped build a statewide coalition and co-authored landmark legislation that established the Illinois Council on Women and Girls in 2018 and so many other cool things. Kina, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. This is funny. So I have to say, um, I'd seen your name running around town. So those who haven't already figured this out, Kina is local to me. But I was walking down the street a couple months ago and I saw the face of someone we know. So Kate, if you're listening, I saw Kate and I said, hey, Kate. And she grabbed you because you were out you were out campaigning and she grabbed you and brought you over and said, oh, my God, Heather, you have to have Kina on your show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And she's a huge fan. She spoke very uh, highly of you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm a big fan of hers. And so <laughs> I I absolutely love it when people who listen to the show recommend other people to be on the show. And I immediately started doing my research and wanted to learn all about you. And you are a powerhouse, young lady. 
Oh my goodness. Likewise. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Well, thank you. But this is all about you. So let's just sort of start with the background. Um, Tell us about your life growing up and were you always politically connected or what sort of brought you into this work? Yeah, that's such a great question. So I grew up on the west side of Chicago in the Austin community, which is a community, as you know, that borders Oak Park. And in that time of me growing up on the, in, on the west side in the Austin community, it, I just automatically got that Chicago, that, that regular Chicago upbringing, which is we are very blue collar organizing city. To add yes. to that, both of my parents are union uh, workers. So my father is a 30 years dues paying member to Teamster Local 743. And my mother is SEIU Local 73. So organizing- <laughs> shout out to the unions. <laughs> <laughs> now they've all so, got to listen to the episode. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We'll be sure to, to send it over to them. So, you know, organizing has been in my blood from the very beginning. When I was about seven years old, a child in my neighborhood was shot and murdered. And I knew the shooter and I knew the victim. And during that time of me witnessing that happening, it allowed me to to say that I can humanize both the shooter and the victim because they were just kids in my neighborhood. Uh, But it also let me know that the bullet was flying in the air long before either one of those kids got a hold to a gun, right? Like when you shut down public services and goods and and public schools, you don't uh, invest in the community that's that's what happens right and that's how people think that they can solve problems i started my activism work in chicago public schools as a chicago public school student and organizing my friends around anti-violence work gun violence prevention work and you know the rest is history i love that so much i love whatever it was in you um, whether it was your parents and your upbringing or this awful awful tragedy that you experienced that you spoke up and got active in high school. That's what I want for my kids. Um, It's what I want for all kids. And I see that happening more and more. And I, I don't know how old you are, Kina, but I suspect you're a lot younger than me. So I'm I'm glad. Yeah, I'm 28. (laughs) There you go. Good, good for you. So I'll be 45 (laughs) in December. Um, Oh, you're young. (laughs) I remember 28. Hell, I didn't even have any kids yet at 28. Now I have four. I know. But I love seeing young people like you, and you are young, um, which is wonderful because that means you have a whole lifetime ahead of you to create and initiate really wonderful, powerful change. Let's just talk for a minute um, because I love that you touched on this horrible thing you experienced as a child, humanizing both the victim and the shooter. Can you speak to that a little bit more detail, please? Yeah, I think that unfortunately in the gun violence prevention conversation nationally, and I would say locally, we do not take a public health epidemic approach. We do not take a decarceral approach. The immediate approach has always been to put more police on the, on the streets. It's been to arrest and incarcerate people. That does not stop violence, right? No, and it doesn't and, work. And it doesn't work. It's a waste of our tax paying money. And it's also very harmful to our society as a whole, right? It tarnishes a lot of the relationships between police and community. It sets this precedent over which communities should be militarized and which ones shouldn't. Yeah. And like I said, it, it just me being able to have that rapport with those kids before that incident happened, it allowed me to see that they were just regular teenagers. You know, they played football in our neighborhood. They, you know, played tag and hide and seek and they were kids. And so yeah. um, it, it, it made me look at gun violence in a completely different way. And I thought to myself, well, if the kids in my neighborhood are just regular kids and this happened to us, what about all the other folks what about all the other folks across the country who are also experiencing intracommunal violence? They too are human and we need to be approaching it that way. And this would be the last thing that I add about it. When I say look at it as a public health epidemic, we have to look at if, for example, an Ebola outbreak happened, the Center for Disease Control would basically isolate those instances and try to figure out a way to stop it from spreading. Right. Yes. And yes. that's how we have to look at violence. We have to look at where is it happening? 
who are the potential of high risk shooters, who has the potential to be high risk to be shot at, and how do we send third parties in that aren't the police to create restorative justice and prevent these things from happening. And there's so many models out there that work like that. And so I got to experience that at a very early age and implement some of those models in my community and they were successful. I love it. I completely, completely agree with you. We've got to rework it from the ground up. Now, to be fair, I have been working in anti-racism work for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm, I do my best to be in the trenches. (laughs) Yeah, you're welcome. Um, but, and I think a lot of folks and maybe not a lot of folks who listen to, because I think people who have found me for the most part, um, know know what I'm what I'm up to what I'm talking about but we got to get out to everybody else because I don't think I just don't think a lot of folks know what they don't know and they've never experienced it from the way you're trying to teach it and that's so important and I when I was doing my research on you I discovered that we have a common I'm going to use the word love but I I'm, this is my <laughs> word and not yours which is I grow Chicago oh yeah oh my goodness yeah. I just got goosebumps you said that. Uh, so uh, I interviewed Robin Carroll. Um, the oh, episode's wow. called Growing Peace. It's episode 44. So y'all go listen. Um, and it's amazing. And I'm really trying to get peace on the show because um, I would yeah. love to have him on the show. Uh, so and powerful. I learned so much from that conversation. How did you? So for those folks who don't already know. Well, I'm going to let Keena tell, tell everybody what I grow is and how you got involved. Yeah, I Grow Chicago is a nonprofit in the Inglewood community that essentially the way that I always saw it was the work that they, the people that they hired in their nonprofit are individuals, A, that come from the community um, and they look for restorative justice practices. They teach positive conflict resolution through yoga and they have something called peace houses where basically they transform abandoned buildings and vacant lots into basically homes that the community can utilize for community space, brave space, and vacant lots that they turn into community gardens. So and cool. essentially it is to, yeah, to sow seeds of peace, right? I and mean, come up with alternative methods of how we build community. I'm so happy that you're connected to I Grow <laughs> Chicago and everybody should know about I Grow Chicago. I uh, sit on the board of I Grow Chicago. So I love it. I was out of town for a conference last week during the the big fundraiser, but I loved it the year before and we're very involved. And and it's I I want to I definitely want to focus on you and and what you're doing, but I I haven't had an opportunity to ask this question and I hope this is a safe enough space to ask you this question. I have on a number of occasions been in the community, in the Peace House. Uh, And I welcome those opportunities for me to be the minority in the group. But I've had several people ask me how I'm avoiding, and I want to know from your perspective, white saviorism. Because I'm not trying to save anybody. Mm -hmm. I just want to support this incredible mission and these incredible people. Mm -hmm. Um, But can we talk about what the differences are? Yeah, so the reason why I accepted the position to sit on the board for I Grow Chicago is because that's like the whole spirit of Robin. Robin does not want to be anybody's white savior. And uh, exactly. She will tell you straight up that it, she built and architected the idea of I Grow Chicago just by happening to drive through the neighborhood. And the story is always that she hops out of her car and she wants to engage with the community. And this is like a, a tiny white lady with blonde hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's so cute, but she goes to Inglewood and she basically just sets up food on the corner and just starts engaging with the people in the community. And it's a very interesting story. But one thing that Robin will tell you is if you ask her in five years, what's the direction of I Grow Chicago? She'll tell you the direction is that it becomes the community takes it over. That it's not me yes. as yes, yeah, and that's like happening. It's, it's completely run by the community, and it's self sufficient and, and sufficient only on the community. And that's what drew me to Agro Chicago because that's the model that it should be. You cannot talk about the solutions in yeah. areas like Austin, Inglewood, which, by the way, Inglewood is in the district that I'm running in for Congress, North Lawndale. 
We got to get these folks out to vote. Yeah, like you can't talk <laughs> about these communities and the solutions that need to happen without having the community at the table and actively yes. making sure that those solutions happen. Yeah, I love that. For me, when I when I step into the Peace House, um, I go in to learn about myself and about others, and it's an incredible experience. So thank you for that. We'll have to talk more about that later. Maybe we can go to some events together. That'd be fun. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So you're deeply rooted in this. I mean, I love what you just said, because I think that's really important. That's part of what you want to do. If you were to win this election, you want to get people involved at the table who are actually being impacted by the laws and things that are changing around them. Yeah, absolutely. The model of our campaign and, and the campaign, and I say our because it's it's not just me running, it's my entire community running. I don't look like any other congressional candidate that this district has ever had the opportunity to vote for. And I've come from an area, I'm the only candidate coming from an area that is a marginalized community in the district, right? So wow. we take the approach of one, putting working class family agendas first, two, being held accountable by the community, and three, making sure that, you know, anything that we put out or anything that I support has been approved by the community first, because that's what being a representative is all about. And the silver lining of a, a Trump administration is that what we now see and what we now know is that the White House and congressional chambers don't belong to any one person. It does not belong to the president. Yes. It does not belong to the legislators. That's the people's house. And if it's the people's house, yes. then we have to let the people run it. That's how I stay grounded and centered around around the work that I'm doing. Oh, my gosh. I love I love that. Ooh, I really hope you win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why did you decide to do this, though? You, you're active in the community. You've done a lot of legislative work here in the state. Um, and I want to talk some more about some of those specifics. But why Congress? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, a lot of people said, you know, you should run for city council first or state rep or, you know, what have you. Number one. No one tells men that they should demote themselves. That's never what, right? No one right? tells young men. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, no one tells young men, <laughs> don't go for it. So I I knew that a lot of the bias that came from people's advice um, for me to do that was based and rooted in Congress being 81% men, mostly white men, mostly attorneys, right? That's not reflective of representative democracy, of what is happening in our country right now. I knew that, and now that I'm talking to constituents and voters, that's all being affirmed, right? They are extremely receptive to our candidacy. But I think that our district is really interesting. We have one of the most racially and economically diverse districts in the country, yet we have some of the greatest disparities. We are the deepest, darkest, bluest district in Illinois, yeah. and we're the fifth most democratic in all of the country, right? So we can serve as a national model wow. for moving progressive agendas forth. The reason why I chose Congress was because, A, I have the organizing background, the coalition building background in the legislative experience of writing policy. But I think that when you speak about the neighborhood that I was born and raised in and the neighborhood that I still live in, the Austin community, when you talk about Austin, you can't compare it to the Gold Coast, which is in our district. You can't compare it to Streeterville, which is right. in our district. You can't compare it to Oak Park, right? You and have those are all really wealthy, wealthy white areas. districts. Yeah. You have to compare yeah. Austin to Flint, Michigan. You have to compare it to Philly, to Baltimore, to East LA, to the Bronx, right? Because that's the level of poverty that we're dealing with. And anytime, as somebody who's written policy, when we talk about liberating people and creating equity, it can't just be a vacuum. It can't just be hyper-local. We wanna talk about clean water and toxins out of the air, everyone in the country needs it. And so that means we have to put people in to those congressional chambers who know how to organize in the congressional chambers, but also on the front lines of the district, because essentially these votes are impacting the entire country. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Holy cow. I mean, that's just so powerful of a thing to hear. And I find it um, 
particularly impressive. I think that's the word I'm going to choose. So first of all, are you, you're not on the ballot yet. Are you still yeah. trying to secure enough vote or signatures to get on the ballot? Yeah. So currently right now um, we're getting signatures. We're collecting signatures. And I mean, it's been so crazy, Heather, like just the love from the community. And I thought this would be the hardest part because everybody tells it. you this is like the most difficult part because you got to get so many signatures. We already have 125 volunteers signed up for our campaign, knocking on doors, canvassing, uh, collecting petitions, hosting house parties, hosting meeting greets, and the you, the excitement is palpable, right? And so we aren't on the ballot yet, but we can already see how our campaign is moving the needle on a yes. lot of these issues. We've, you know, we have never seen the congressman host this many town halls. <laughs> so he's been hosting town halls. We, we recently saw that he just introduced some legislation about surprise billing and how do we curb surprise billing for medical bills that spring up on everyday American people and impact working class families. He wasn't talking about that a primary or two ago, right? Like we, we are pushing the needle and we are pushing the issues yeah. to the left and that's how we know it is working. It is working. And so we're excited. Yeah. That is awesome. I, I love that. So because the current congressman in this seat has been here for a very long time um, and it's quite 22 years, quite yeah. challenging to unseat. And there is a, another community member that we both know well, Anthony Clark. I had Anthony on the show, uh, gosh, a long time ago, <laughs> like like 70 episodes ago or something. Um, and so you and Anthony are running against each other to to get on the primaries to run against the incumbent. What are the challenges? I mean, I love, I want to see as many people run as possible. I think it's wonderful to run for office, but what are the challenges with two progressive black young candidates going up against each other against an incumbent? You know, to be quite honest, it it really hasn't been a challenge. Our campaign has from the very start had a lot of momentum you know, we haven't run into people not wanting to support us because there's another progressive in the race. As a matter of fact, you know, I mean, we haven't, <laughs> and I'm just being 100% honest. It's it's not a... I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. think it's absolutely great, and I think it speaks to the grassroots movement that we're building in our campaign, and also people just looking at the experience, right? I think that people are... We have registered people to vote, who've never voted before the oldest voter yes, that now we got to get him to the polls Yeah, we got to get him to the polls <laughs> the, the oldest voter that i registered was born in 1958 never voted before wow and heard our stump speech wow heard what our campaign was about and told me that i'd be the first person that they ever voted for then the youngest person that we've registered to vote was born in 2001 Right. Like how crazy is it that the kids born in 2001 are now yeah. um, voting in presidential so elections crazy. Um, and they're <laughs> excited and electrified because it's it feels like one of us is being represented. And so we haven't run into any challenges and I'm grateful and thankful for that. But I also uh, share in your ideology, Heather, that we need to give folks ballot access. We need to give voters the ability to hear from candidates. And if you know, you're good, then you'll win. And if we're good, then we'll win. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we, we've just been so inspired, uh, just by the whole campaign, but I have not run into the, the, any challenges with Anthony being, being a part of this, this campaign trail. I, I think that's great. I love that. My concern and you, and I briefly talked about this on the street corner a couple of months ago is that, of course, I want you both to make the ballot. Cause I want anybody to make the ballot that it has progressive forward thinking, but I worry about a split vote and then the other guy gets reelected. Yeah. So we hear that oftentimes that if you have two progressives who are in the race or two similar candidates that are in the race, then um, the vote will be split. The, the truth of the matter is what this comes down to is I'm running against Congressman Davis and turning this into a bilateral fight, right? And not just a regular fight for yeah, a good seat for you. And Washington DC, we're going to turn this into a street fight, right? Like we have to pull our <laughs> we do, we have to pull these incumbents out of their complacency and of their 
their feeling like their name recognition is just going to help them float and we have to mobilize and galvanize people in these communities and that's what we're doing and i think ultimately what 2020 is going to come down to is a return of a representative democracy and that basically means the voters who feel like the person who's resonating with them the most and the person with the strongest ground game is the one that's going to pull ahead, even ahead of the incumbent. So like I said, we're extremely yes. confident in our campaign just because we've been endorsed by, we're the only insurgent candidates that have been endorsed by elected officials within the district. So Arthur Walker Petticola, Oak Park Village trustee endorsed us. Erica Bachner, River Forest trustee endorsed us. We've been endorsed by National PAC, Blue America PAC. We've been endorsed by Northside Democracy for America. And we just got endorsed by Women's March Illinois this morning. Congratulations. I mean, we're building the groundswell and yes. um, we're ready to throw down in Illinois 7. And so I've been extremely <laughs> confident and I don't think that I'm not concerned about splitting the vote because I think that our campaign is going to do an extremely great job at out organizing people and getting to the root causes of what's happening in this district. And it's because I'm, I'm living amongst some of the hardest hits constituents, not just in the state of Illinois, but in our country, right? In the Austin community. And so my sense of urgency to get this stuff done and to um, really get the message out is definitely there. And we're, we're, we're being scrappy. We're definitely being scrappy. I love it. I cannot wait to see you on the Congress floor, which... <laughs> Makes me feel like I'm. I want to sing a Hamilton lyric. I can't. It's still. <laughs> what? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not gonna sing right now because I have a cold. But I could do it. Yeah, I like that. I like that street fight concept. The scrappiness. If anybody can do it, I believe it's you. I love that. Can you tell folks? I mentioned the Illinois Council on Women and Girls. To just quickly tell us what that is, please. Yeah, so the Illinois Council on Women and Girls was born out of, in 2017, I happened to be reading that Donald Trump, the occupant of the White House, got rid of uh, an Obama era policy called the White House Council on Women and Girls, which was an executive mm. order that President Obama created in 2009 with Valerie Jarrett, Tina Chin, and Mrs. Obama. And essentially, what that executive order was under the Obama administration was prote to protect women and girls across the country on the federal level and force federal agencies to look at their policies through a gender lens. Of course, when the occupant got into the White House, he got rid of it. And I brought it back on the state level and, and wrote it as a law, not as an executive order. I wanted it to be set in stone. Yes. And I wanted it to be law of the land of Illinois. And our version of the Illinois Council of Women and Girls protected the rights of the transgender community um, and non-binary community, expanded reproductive health care and education. It centered the voices of women of color. It centered working class women. And essentially this council uh, would serve as an advisory board to the governor and state lawmakers in the Illinois General Assembly to say that any laws or programs that come across the state of Illinois or impact women and girls in the state of Illinois would be advised through this council. And it just was mind boggling that we did not have a nucleus in the Illinois General Assembly yeah. for legislation that was gender based, right? Because we know that the pay wage equity gap exists. We know that sexual assault and campus sexual assault exists. So long story short, I got pushed back from both the Democrats and Republicans in the Illinois General Assembly who said, wow. if you don't take the transgender language out of the bill, then we will put it on the hot list and not pass it. And my response was not without a fight. And, uh, you know, I fought them. We, I traveled to 68 <laughs> counties out of 102 in the state. I built a coalition of Republican women, Democratic women, independent women, business owners, just single moms, uh, just folks all across the state. And we won. We won it in the House. We won it awesome. in the Senate. And then we forced Bruce Rauner. Governor Rauner was actually the <laughs> one who had to sign it into law of oh all people. Oh my God, that's so awesome. So we kind of, we twisted his arm until he said uncle and, <laughs> and, I love and it. he signed it into law. And um, 
it was just such a great organizing victory, Heather. It just showed the power of people and what can get done when you 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 don't have to sit. I'm not an elected official, right? Like I co-wrote okay. this legislation as a concerned citizen. And what I realized was that you don't need to be an elected official or sit in a seat generation after generation to get things done. You need political courage. And that's what we had. And we got it done. And now it's a, a live living thing. Oh. Um, and Lieutenant Governor Stratton, the first African-American and woman uh, to sit as a lieutenant governor of the state. She is now the chairwoman of the council and um, they're doing great work. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, I can't. I said this like 12. I cannot wait to see you on the Congress floor. I have no doubt um, <laughs> that eventually you're going to get there or bigger or wherever it is that you want to go. My goodness, what an incredible role model you are for young people, young women, young people of color, like, but everybody, I'm, I want to, I want to put you at the table with my four daughters f- for, for Aww. real, like, let, come on over for dinner. <laughs> Kina, what has been the biggest struggle for you so far with this campaign? Yeah, you know, I think people having the assumption of, or when I hear folks say, you're not a traditional candidate. And it's like, is it because right? that's the right answer <laughs> right like thank you first of all thank you uh but is you know we, i know that they're saying that because i'm young because i'm working class because i'm black because i'm a woman that all of those things unfortunately make us untraditional candidates but i think the response that you had has always been kind of what i had is that yeah it it makes me very different and that's an asset you know to have and i yes it is remember yeah. when we were drafting the legislation for house bill 5544 the illinois council on women and girls act that it really did make a difference that i looked out of all of these intersectional lenses right because at yeah. first people just wanted it to be women and girls and i thought well all of us don't identify as woman and girl, right? All of us, you know, don't identify in that way. And then even if we do, why are we not including the transgender community, right? Why are we not including domestic workers and immigrant women and all of these people who we need to galvanize around who we don't traditionally galvanize around? And that was the moment that the light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, this is not just this myth that they sell us about identity politics. This is when you can look out of these lens lens and, and, and write policy, you write comprehensive policy, you write policy that is long lasting and enduring. It has great solutions because you've been marginalized. And so I think that's been difficult is like navigating these spaces and, and, and saying that, it's not just about identity politics because you shouldn't vote for somebody just because they're black or they're a woman or any of that, but you should vote for representation, right? And full representation and inclusivity. Yeah, and for so, sure. Um, I've been having some very interesting conversations about that and, and we've been having some great breakthroughs, but of course, I'm not the first one to deal with these kinds of discriminations or kind of descriptors. There are so many women who were trailblazers who came before me and they made my climb up the mountain just a little bit easier and smoother because they went through, you know, what I'm going through, through now. And so, um, those have been big challenges. Yeah. I, I love that, though, because they're the right kinds of challenges and you just keep rising right. to the occasion. What would you say has been your biggest pleasant surprise? Oh, that's such a great question. No one asks me that. <laughs> um, I think the pleasant surprise that I've seen is that since I've been running, there are young African American men in my community who we know that they're, you know, they they have voter low voter turnout, right? Yes. And yes. the sense of pride that they have felt in seeing me run for office is like mm. so 
it's it it, it has taken me a, a, a back um one day i had this movie screening on the south side at Dusabo and i came home it was about 8 or 9 p.m at night and i get off the green line on laramie and i'm like walking down the street to go home I, you know my head's all buried in my phone it's kind of dark outside well it is dark outside because it's evening and there's a group of young men from my community who who are walking to the restaurant the local restaurant and as i walk past them one of them just kind of shouts out like hey congresswoman and i was like what like i i was so stunned that he had said that because he wasn't somebody who i knew in the community it's just been spreading like wildfire that one of us is running <laughs> for office and um it just it has excited me that they've been excited right that we yeah. can have these conversations that they can come to me and say i am afraid of police brutality i am afraid of yeah. housing insecurity and food insecurity in our our community you know and be really vulnerable and have those conversations with me and me take that those back to the public forums and the platform that i'm standing on and let other people know you know these are like i said the constituents who are being hardest hit by these federal rollbacks yeah. so i've been surprised by the young people in my community who just like like they see one of my ads on Facebook or they just see one of my flyers floating around the neighborhood and then they see my face and they put make the connection. Right. And so uh, we're excited to see what the exit polling yeah. is going <laughs> to look that's like. That's wonderful. I mean, that's more more than anything in the world. We need the youth vote um, and the black vote, but we need that youth vote. So we got to get Absolutely. these folks out. So I love, love, love that you're doing that. Does it feel brave to you what you're doing? No, it feels like regular, like this is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Good for you. You know, I, I never, um, I think there's bravery and vulnerability. And I think anybody who runs for public office is being extremely vulnerable. Yeah. Um, but I've always felt like from the moment that I've started to do this, that it was the right natural next step to do. Yeah, you were clearly born for it. Clearly. I don't know if I was born for I it. I think so. But what I will <laughs> say, what I will say is that, like I said, having that organizing in my blood has definitely pushed me into places where sometimes I'm the only person standing up and speaking out about stuff. And what this has showed me is that, no, this takes a community. This takes a village. It's not just you. The way that we get across the finish line and the only way we can get across the finish line is if we go together right it's like the yeah. old adage of like if you want to go if you want to get somewhere fast go alone but if you want to go far you go together right yeah. and so we want to yeah. go far we want to break barriers and uh, we want to leap over the bar and that requires you know the collective so no, I, I don't know if it makes me feel brave I know that I felt very vulnerable and raw in this whole process because that's brave. Okay, well, that's brave. <laughs> Definitely. It's very brave to be vulnerable and raw because you put you risk so much putting yourself out there like that. But I do believe that if you if you don't come at it from a, a place of vulnerability, people can't connect with you. Oh, so. absolutely. You got to connect yeah. with people. You got to yeah. relate to their stories for yeah, sure. For um, sure. So, yeah. So, Kina, I would love to know, because so much of, of what you've been doing is is little mini successes that build up to be something really big and wonderful. How do you celebrate your successes? Um, with my family, I'm very low maintenance. <laughs> like, That's OK. It doesn't I mean, die. it could be a little internal dance party. Yeah, I usually like, have a dance party. <laughs> I'm so easily entertained, so easily appeased, like not a lot. I think just really making my parents proud and my family proud. It's just like, Aww, it's like the best that. way to celebrate, right? Because you, that's something money cannot you. buy, you know, um, to, True story. yeah, just to feel yeah. like you're, you're, you're creating new ways of lineage and legacy and passing those traditions down to your family. So like, I really celebrate with my family and I'm, I'm the most low maintenance person. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What is your favorite charitable organization to support? That's so crazy that you say that. I Grow Chicago is my favorite. I'm always ah, plugging it. 
Yay. I'm always yeah, plugging Ivor Chicago because it's so important. The best way to stop a bullet is opportunity. And that's what they're providing people. And um, I'm just so proud of uh, Robin, who's getting a CNN Hero of the Year award. Um, oh, well earned. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. awesome. And Aaron, yeah. shout out to Aaron Vogel and Quentin Mabels, yep. who are co-executive directors of iGrow Chicago and just two of my best friends who've just been in this gun violence prevention movement work with me uh, for a really long time. And so iGrow is always who I plug. That's awesome. Y'all, every week I ask you, learn more. And we've put a lot of stuff out on, on iGrow. I'm a big, big fan. So um, go check them out. If you have something to give, time, money, energy, likes, follows, whatever it is, please do that. Kina, will you share your three words with us one last time? Yes. Tenacious leader, problem solver. Yes. Yes, you are. (laughs) Those are amazing three words. They describe you well. I have so many more questions and there's so much more I want to talk to you about. But of course, we have time constraints within the show. But I am a super fan. And so I can't wait to support you and watch you grow. Thank you so very much for being here with us on The Brave Files. Thank you for having me, Heather. This was great. Thank you. You are welcome. You know, folks, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And that's exactly what Kina and people like her are doing. And now I'm urging all of you to go out and do the same. This is not the time for sitting idly by and watching and waiting to see what happens. This is the time to get up, get involved and get into action. We need you to vote and help others to vote. And if you are not going to go out and knock on doors, that's okay. You don't have to hand out flyers, but there are ways you can help. We need you. So whatever that is, take action. If you're not local, find a a local person that you can get behind and support because we can't create the change we want to create if we don't do it together as a community, both a, a local community and a community at large. And I would love to know what you think of this episode or anything you've heard here on The Brave File. So be sure to give us a call at 312-646-0205 and let us know what you think of the show. Also, make sure you are here next week on Thursday, yes, Thanksgiving, for our annual gratitude episode. It's my very favorite episode of the year. And I promise that once you listen, it will keep a smile on your face all day long. If you love what we do here, if you love the guests we have on, if you want to see us grow and be part of building um, our brave community, please consider being a Patreon of the show. You can find out all of the details at patreon.com slash brave files. There is a tier for you. There are cool prizes, but mostly you just get to help me build this incredible movement and I cannot do it without you. Thank you so much for being here. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and always to go out and choose bravely. The Brave Files is proudly supported by Audible. If you enjoy listening to podcasts, you're sure to love listening to your favorite books on Audible. Get your free 30-day trial complete with a credit for a free audiobook download today simply by visiting audibletrial.com slash the Brave Files. Again, that's visiting audibletrial.com slash the Brave Files. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes, or get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we'd love to know what you think. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching, coaching that helps you maintain a life well lived and a business well run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music is produced by Matt Lewis. Follow him on Instagram at mattmmusic or visit his website, theunionband.com. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to our associate producer, Kim Statler. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.